Hi, I'm Faiza Rizvi, Senior Associate Editor with Heart Energy, and I will be your host for today's webinar on subsurface cloud optimization and transformation. Now, seismic data is the heaviest data from where the oil and gas workflow starts, and there's been a tremendous amount of interest from the industry at large on what to do to really optimize the seismic data workflow. So we decided to bring together key technology companies to discuss and explore this topic and share some examples of how the industry is evolving. Now, I can tell you this is going to be a great session. We have an excellent lineup of speakers and let me quickly introduce them to you. With us today is Mick Isernia, Head of Subsurface Solutions at Amazon Web Services. Also with us is Simon Kendall, CEO at Interica. We're also joined by Andy James, Chief Product Officer at Blueware. And our fourth panelist is Fabrice Buran, Chief Commercial Officer at INT. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. We look forward to a great discussion. I'd also like to thank all our attendees who have tuned in this morning. Now, for some housekeeping rules real quick, as a reminder, all attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions at any point during the discussion, please submit them using the chat feature, and the speakers will be more than happy to answer those during the Q&A session. Also, a recording of today's presentation will be shared after the webinar. So without further ado, let's begin the discussion with a brief round of introductions from the speakers themselves. Mick, would you like to start? Hi, Faiza. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is Mick Izerny. I'm with AWS. Uh, my role in AWS is to lead uh, what we call subsurface solutions, a part of the energy IBU. My experience in oil and gas is about 20 years. I started with Hewlett Packard and then Microsoft and NVIDIA, always in a role of uh, kind of managing the ecosystem, the partner ecosystem in subsurface. Um, and yeah, I'm similarly similar role today at AWS. Great, Andy, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Yeah, thanks Faisa. Hi, I'm Andy James. I'm the Pro Chief Product Officer at Blueware. Blueware is a really innovative company that's been working with signal data such as seismic data and over the last few years, we've been innovating workflows in the cloud. Really exciting place to be right now. Great. Next up, we have Fabrice Buran. Yes. Hi. Thank you, uh, Faiza. In one minute, uh, my name is Fabrice Buran. I'm CCO at INT, uh, which I joined five years ago to accompany the launch of our data visualization platform named iVibe. Been working in digital transformation in, for many years in various uh, industries and, and focused more recently on the energy, which has picked up some steam over the, the past few years. At INT, we specialize in INT uh, in uh, scientific data visualization. Uh, so we talk about large, large, large data set and geoscience data. So um, meaning, you know, well seismic or all the fun stuff. Glad to be here today. Be here Thank today. You. Great. Simon, Great. would you like to Sorry, I have to unmute. I'm Simon Kendall. I'm the Chief Executive at uh, Interica. I've uh, started my life as a, a geoscientist and uh, transferred across into data management uh, after, uh, well, for the last 20 years, with the view that data management could uh, improve, uh, streamline, and deliver great value uh, to the energy industry. So uh, that's my uh, background. And I've been uh, really uh, on a cloud journey since about 2016 in terms of the transformation of our data sets in, in this industry. Wonderful. Thank you all for the introductions. Now we now start with my first question, and this one's for Mick. Now, with the energy transition becoming a major focus for operators, what is Amazon Web Services' perspective on the geoscience portion of the workflow? And also, Mick, if you could tell us, where are you focusing your efforts? All right. So, uh, as I said, I joined AWS about a year ago, and just before I joined, um, AWS decided to create an energy uh, business unit. Um, this indicates a very strategic focus for from our company into energy, and energy includes the traditional oil and gas as well as new energies. So that's uh, it's a very significant investment. We believe there is a, a strategic value for the planet, the overall energy market. In um, in GNG, obviously we don't build a GNG software or uh, software exp for exploration and production and so on. Uh, all of our work is very much with uh, with partners. Our focus, we see our focus as to build solutions uh, to remove bottlenecks and increase efficiency 
for people in, in the workflow. Ultimately, the objective is to improve subsurface decision quality. That's what we see the ultimate objective. Seismic, from this perspective, is really key. It's one of the first uh, data sets that is used to understand the subsurface. And interesting enough, while companies are kind of more focused in their exploration efforts with the changes in the industry, seismic data itself is going to become more complex, bigger and more difficult to handle, but with a lot, a rich, a lot more richer of information. So it's going to have an impact on high performance computing, machine learning, um, OSDU we know is a big initiative around data that includes seismic as the first step. So that's a pretty important piece. The ecosystem itself is fundamental and is in full motion now. Cloud is becoming very strategic to many partners. That was not the case until a few years ago. Whereas the US created a real, a real drive for everybody as well. And so we see ISVs as fundamental for innovation and workflow acceleration, as I said. So there is a lot to be gained in starting the journey uh, now. Uh, the journey is not necessarily the full OSDU, but even starting with seismic data, I think there is a significant uh, return on investment for customer and hopefully we'll be able to give some examples in the call today. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mick. Now, it seems like the first step is the consolidation of ENP data, seismic in particular. Now, I'd like to know, and Simon, if you could answer this one, how can ENP companies manage to integrate cloud into their IT infrastructures, specifically in relation to seismic data? Sure, thank you. Um, as, uh, as Mick has just said, we're happy to be part of the overall ecosystem, and it's those first steps that companies need to take. It is not necessarily an all or nothing step. And uh, from our point of view, we look at developing a, a powerful and user-friendly uh, data management platform that bridges the on-premise scenario with the cloud. Everyone has to take a journey. And in taking that journey, um, we are working with, um, with AWS. We're incorporating the work of OSDU. And uh, we use rich metadata to deliver cost savings that are immediately available through the intelligent S3 tiering that we can manage with um, AWS. So really it's part of that journey and being a key part of that overall movement that's occurring in the industry today. Great, thanks Simon. Now if all ENP data can be consolidated and is now relatively easy to identify, now the remaining opportunity I think is to enable a data streaming model similar to what we experience every day with music, movies and other data types. Now Andy, Blue Air has pioneered this technology. Can you please help us understand what it means? What does it take to enable this capability and what value does it deliver? Sure. It, it wasn't that long ago that we would go to the video store to, to rent a movie. And so we have this mindset of we always bring all of the data to what we want to do with it. And, and we bring that VHS tape home and we put in our VCR. But if you think about the way we watch TV today, it's completely transformed. We've got access to a massive online library of, of all of these streaming movies, TV series from the past, um, YouTube videos and how-tos to, how and things. And we can access any part of that data at any particular time from any device that we want to. And so there's a huge opportunity to take that mindset and that approach to different data. And the cloud is enabling that. So um, using things like object store to store data in Amazon S3 and, and move in the library of your seismic data centrally into OSDU using formats like OpenVDS. We can have access to our entire library of seismic data and that data can be delivered and converted so quickly with modern GPUs on, on the workstations that data can be served up into existing applications. So as Mick mentioned earlier about different formats, you don't need to worry about lots of different formats. You have one copy and that data can be, just be transcoded on the fly into formats such as Petrel, ZGY, PaleoScan formats and others within the industry as well. So it's really transformational and really enables uh, digital transformations to become available today. 
Right, thank you, Andy, for that interesting insight. Now, at this point, I'd like to remind our attendees that if you have any questions, please submit them now using the chat window. So moving forward, if I understand correctly, all seismic data can be consolidated in OpenVDS and all the existing applications can leverage this model today for seismic data. Uh, Mick, can you tell us how we can quantify the overall IT savings? It's an interesting question because uh, seismic data really touches very different places, right? So of course, uh, it starts with acquisition. There is a significant months that uh, companies have to wait before they can actually get hold of the data that has been acquired. So there are opportunities to make the data available faster uh, while the data is acquired, directly transferring to the cloud and enabling people to do QC and other early parts of the of the pre-processing, for example. Uh, that That's an area that is significant value and is very much in terms of saving time or getting data early enough that you can have uh, you know more time available to do part of the workflow. Then when you go into the more interpretation space that we're talking about today, it's interesting that for every file coming into the interpretation workflow, for every stack coming in in 3D Seismic, that file tends to be copied, duplicated and converted to different formats, you know, 15, 20, even hundreds of times, depending on, on the, the situation how long the, the project is. Uh, so it's interesting that if you think about from that perspective, you have hundreds of copies over several months. And some of these copies are not just copying a file on your PC. We are talking terabyte scale files. Sometimes some of these operations can take hours. Sometimes it's something you, you start now and you come back the next day. So it's not trivial. It's a significant amount of time that all the geoscientists are investing or wasting, depending on, on how you see it. So in some way, an oil company uh, invests uh, in, in a geoscientist and a significant part of this person's uh, time is actually invested on file operation. I think we can do better than that. That's, the, that's a very important thing that we should probably uh, take across in the conversation, right? Now, the other part is how much data, how much seismic data. When a company says, let's say, I have one petabyte of seismic data, in reality, they have to over-provision many, many times. So the data ends up being on tapes, sometimes is in archiving, and archiving has to be uh, redundant, so usually three copies. Then there is a version, a part of the data is on, in HPC storage, another part of this data is interpretation storage. When you put it all together, we discovered that it's five times or more over provisioning. When you move this data in a cloud concept, first of all, redundancy is built in. So you don't have to think about redundancy, it's part of uh, the fact that cloud data is automatically redundant. So you reduce all this over provisioning into a proper provisioning, and there is millions of dollars at stake just in terms of storage costs. I think the biggest value that I see is, again, the time and the efficiency of the people, and also the optimization of software licensing, because while people do file operation, they are actually locking a, a, an expensive software license um, doing that. Right. Well, these are significant savings, Mick, and that should be very relevant to the industry today. Um, Fabrice, like Bluebear and Enterica, INT has been one of the early supporters of OSDU and also an early adopter of OpenVDS. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know your thoughts on how you see a consolidated ENP data foundation delivering value to the workflow. Sure. Um, well, as, as we know, one major frustration in the oil and gas industry for decades was the inability to break down silos and the lack of collaboration across domains with highly proprietary systems, at times strong in few areas and sometimes weak in others. So with the OSSU initiative, it's been the main driver to align operators and technology providers to create a common data ecosystem where interoperability is central. And about your question, the value in a consolidated ENP data is to enable complementary uh, modern technology to be more agile, to be integrated, and to leverage best of breed capabilities, because we know that one size does not fit all. And in this ecosystem, I think what's compelling is we've all worked together to make sure that our respective system works seamlessly within the AWS um, OSDU data platform. And let me give you three examples. So the number one is that IVAP fully supports uh, the OSDU seismic DDMS to visualize the seismic data. 
Um, so it means you can see 2D, 3D traces, surveys, um, but also you can co-visualize that data with other type of data like wells and other data types. The second thing that we did, we, we supported, you know, we made sure that AI app support um, open VDS because it means performance for the end user and the ability to navigate through a large amount of data, which is very important when you go into the cloud, is the user experience and the efficiency. And then number three, um, we saw a need from operators to create IVAP ML process connector to connect and launch this ML and AI programs from various players like you know, AWS SageMaker or Blueware Deep Learning to try to create, you know, this one um, continuity into the system. So in the analogy, I like the analogy that Andy talked about, uh, streaming music um, or movies and how the industry has changed. Well, IVAP is like your music or video player, except in that case, this is your universal viewer for seismic data. And once the data is ingested in an OSDU data platform, cleansed, enriched, and managed, it becomes consumable by IVAP. So what it means for the user is it can access that data, it can start to visualize traces, do some QC, conduct data exploration, analyze, and once it finds the right data set, it can actually start to select it and put it to work with computation. And by launching ML and AI from various programs, like we were talking about um, deep learning from uh, from Brewer. So all this, you can do it from a single digital plat workspace. And that's what's important here, is how the ecosystem um, can finally deliver a good user experience. I think Mick talked about the duplication that the costs associated, but you have to think also from the user experience having to go in all the systems and manipulate that, and also deliver a true end um, to end workflow. So I think it, this offers, at the end of the day, a unique opportunity to reduce the processing time, the interpretation, modeling time, and general knowledge actually to extract data. Excellent. Thank you, Fabrice, for that very interesting insight. Now, you just mentioned another buzzword, which is machine learning. Andy, if you can answer this one, I'd like to know how can open VDS and seismic streaming enable the application of AI machine learning to seismic data? Yeah, sure. Definitely not a buzzword, though. I mean, the fact that you can go to your mobile phone and go to your image library and just do a search for something and and it will bring up all of the images that have that object in i mean so these are mainstream features that are available today so definitely not a buzzword but in the most simplistic terms uh, an ml workflow can really determine whether a picture of a, a cat or a dog is actually a cat or a dog and in order to achieve that you need a massive amount of training data and that training data is typically you know, hundreds of thousands of pictures of dogs and hundreds of thousands of pictures of cats. And then the network logic basically does the, all, of, all of the work for you. Um, the, the process is, is really similar for seismic data, but instead of just little tiled pictures of cats and dogs, that data is broken up and represented as hundreds of thousands of small pieces of that overall seismic volume represented as small tiles um, and these have to be pre-created and pre-loaded uh, into tools such as tensorflow which really are mainstream deep learning engines um, if data is stored inside open vds that data can be streamed directly into tensorflow as opposed to pre-created as hundreds of thousands of images on disk so it's extremely efficient, it can be extremely random, which is something you need for deep learning, and it can all be done on the fly, saving data preparation. The result is a really enhanced interactive workflow. And so we get much better results, we get more accuracy, we get to involve the geoscientist in the actual process of doing the training and the inference. Um, and the results are, are faster, they're more accurate, and they're better. 
And when you get better results, you can do more and you can interpret more and you can reduce risk and uncertainty for what are hundreds of millions of dollars worth of drilling decisions um, by identifying uh, information that could cause risk for drilling much earlier and more accurately. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, that surely sounds game changing. Uh, Fabrice, can you now discuss <clears throat> some other examples of projects or use cases on your previous discussion and how fast can a customer put together a POV? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's that's an interesting question. So we had um, we actually we got challenged by one operator that wanted to actually um, test a little bit this this integration. So we just conducted a, an interesting uh, exercise with Ali Burton uh, in the past few weeks, where um, we used OSDU DDMS API to connect EDM to IVAP in just a couple of weeks, and the result. Um, was important because the idea was once the EDM uh, data is ingested into SDU and registers, it becomes consumable by any other app um, in OSDU. And uh, in that case, because of this connection, it was through IVAP, where actually a user can search and visualize the data from EDM and co-visualize it with any other data types. So I think it was an interesting um, practical exercise to demonstrate, you know, how we can we can have systems talking to each other really rapidly. Great, thank you, Fabrice. Now, it sounds like OS, OSDU is enabling the industry to come together and collaborate better. And I think all four of you are a testament to this. Uh, we'll now open the floor for questions. Um, we'll hear from the audience. If they have any questions, please send them using the chat feature. Um, and the panelists will be more than happy to answer those. But while we're waiting for the audience to send in their questions, I actually have one uh, for you, Mick, if you could answer this. As many operators are at different stages of uptake, and if I am a small operator with a lot of big seismic following in the wake of this technology boom, how would you advise that I find the right balance of on-prem storage and the offline global archive? So I would say just from you and my perspective, and then we'll ask Simon to chime in because they are a lot more involved with this with this portion of the of the workflow. Um, from our perspective, we tend to see companies uh, approaching this in two different ways. They either, e either have an OSDU or big data uh, movement connected to either the, the interpretation workflow itself or processing or machine learning. That could be an angle. Another one could be more specific project where they have uh, evaluated things like the machine learning that Andy mentioned before, and they want to enable only that little piece, for example, to complement and augment their existing workflow. So it really depends. There are two kind of extremes. One could be just moving some small amount of data to, to automate some computational machine learning. Another one could be a more broader uh, pro project. But maybe Simon, has, you know, his company is a lot more involved with this part of the workflow, so I would like maybe him to comment uh, further. Thanks very much, Mick. Um, yeah, there's probably quite a bit to say in, in this uh, sort of world. Um, you know, Seismic is one of the, if not the key data asset for every EMP company. And there's a long and rich history of it. So we know that in any company, these seismic data assets have a long life and they have a very wide uh, set of aspects to their usage. And what we do see is that as the adoption of the cloud is moving at different rates in different companies, there are opportunities as well as potential pitfalls as to how these new working practices are actually adopted. And to, to paraphrase one of, my, uh, one of my colleagues, he says, there is an opportunity here, but there is also an opportunity to create a new digital landfill. And really it's uh, the opportunity to not create the new digital landfill that maybe is the most exciting so that we can move data into this new world. We can establish the metadata that identifies the provenance, the lineage, and everything we need to know about the data set. And that um, in doing that, we retain the visibility over the data, even if we are achieving the cost savings as we migrate things, for instance, into Glacier or Glacier Deep Archive, um, so that we can reduce the OPEX. Now, Everyone focuses on the cost, but the, the cost perhaps or the, the value proposition is far greater. And by that, what I'm trying to say is that we're not looking just about the enterprise storage costs, 
but we're also looking at what we can do with the data, how we can better utilize it, and how we can realize value. And through the sorts of technologies that um, you heard something about here, and Andy has talked about, and Fabrice have talked about, I'm most struck maybe by an example of one of our um, clients, one of our, our joint clients in here, who increased reserves on a, a single asset very markedly, not as a result of drilling another well, but of actually analyzing all the data, reinterpreting all the data, and understanding what the total reserve in a field was that enabled them to upgrade their resources and their reserves. And, and that fundamentally changes the value of a company. So I think that's really exciting. Um, at the same time, it, it, we, we also talked about how SegY was a standard. I'm not sure it was ever the standard. And um, we're seeing already that with OSDU and um, with the development of the different formats and standards, then we're getting away from a lot of those problems, which in terms removes all of the um, inhibitors of, of moving data between the different geoscience applications. And OSDU represents that advantage that, that potential to have a single referenceable um, copy of the data with the full data lineage and the, the need to um, have expensive and siloed corporate data repositories goes away. Uh, I'm also struck, you know, yesterday I read the news, I saw that BHP is going to merge its assets in with Woodside. And you say, well, here's another example of energy transition how different companies not only move data um, within their organization and move to OSDU for commercial advantage, but how companies need to move data between organizations so that they overall need to be able to take data and move it into and out of OSDU. And overall, that we um, are working to shorten those cycle times and make the workflows much easier to operate in the current world. So maybe maybe that's rather a longer answer um, than you were intending, Nick, and Pfizer, I'll, I'll hand back to you um, to continue forward here a bit. Sure, thank you, Simon. But before we move forward, uh, Mick, if you could, uh, just coming back again to the, to the the question where we talked about how customers can put together a POV, can you give us an example of how Amazon Web Services uh, has worked in that field? Yeah, so again, going more specific on the what I said before, so let me use a couple of examples. We have uh, maybe the simplest examples if where customers want to use some machine learning to augment their workflow. Their workflow is completely on-prem. Um, so they are thinking, how do I enable data movement from on-prem to cloud securely just for that specific data set or a small amount of data for a specific project. So we enable that securely. In the cloud, you will then be able to use uh, machine learning, taking advantage of the scalability of the cloud. Everything happens uh, pretty seamlessly from an end user perspective because then the user will have like a local, uh, it feels like a local application, but it's actually running in the cloud. So it does all the machine learning work. The results, when the results are done, the results are then securely moved back directly uh, back on the on-prem. So that's a, a kind of, it's a loop that goes from on-prem to the cloud seamlessly from the end user and is only to augment the workflow. A much bigger project is uh, with a larger oil company where they already have, and it's in a, a very large, um, data management platform they've built of, of their own, where they manage not only all their data, but also all the lineage uh, in, inside their data. And so with, with them, we have a more broader OSDU project where we're moving some data intelligently, interrogating their data management platform, move it to the cloud securely, and enabling a workflow now of application that includes many of the well-known uh, application packages out there. And in that example, we're actually using OpenVDS as the, as the common data format and FAST from Blueware to stream and, and, and transcode from uh, the core, the central data to the different applications. So that's, that's an example. We're also, in that specific uh, uh, use case, we're also looking at how the streaming model could support much better dispersed uh, asset teams. So teams that uh, are sitting in very remote locations and often all companies have to duplicate the data to support their needs. Uh, in many cases, the streaming model can accommodate their needs by keeping the data centralized anyway. These are just a couple of examples. 
Great, thank you, Mick, for that um, excellent insight. Andy, would you like to add a few examples from how your company is working here? Sure, thank you. Um, the the OS, I've often heard the OSTU platform isn't mature, and my response to that is, well, it will be in about 20 years. I think the key thing is that there's a huge amount of value to be gained immediately from the, the data platform as it stands, and that value is going to just simply increase over time. Um, Blueware has three key technologies that are available and work either as part of the data platform itself or as commercial applications that leverage um, data within the data platform. We've talked about it already, but OpenVDS um, is a core component of the OSDU data platform and is able to store all sorts of seismic data. And it overcomes the challenge of dealing with large data sets such as seismic data in the cloud. It makes cost-effective use of storage platforms like Amazon's S3 storage. Um, and then it supports true lossless compression as well. So it's a really cool way to have your data in the cloud and enable all of those streaming workflows as well. It's really kind of groundbreaking in terms of what you can do. Um, the, the second technology is fast, and that's really the ability to stream data as we talked about. We, we like to sort of talk about it's sort of the Netflix of seismic data. Um, but that technology basically sits alongside your applications, delivering data directly into those applications without having to change the applications, um, enabling a central source for your, uh, your data itself. And then the, the third solution is, um, is around deep learning. We have a product called Interactive AI that uses the machine learning techniques I mentioned earlier. And this, along with FAST, can be plugged directly into open, uh, the OSDU data platform on AWS today. And thank you, Andy. Uh, Simon, we'd like to hear from you now, and if you'd like to share any examples or use cases from Interica. Sure. Um, you know, I talked earlier about the, the move of assets, uh, energy transition, and, and we see this as a, not only a, an ongoing process, but a, an increasing process. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're going to do that sort of thing, then there are a series of opportunities and challenges that are out there. And almost any time that a major company or a, an independent company sells an asset, there is a period of time in which the new owner has the ability to get their hands around all of the data associated with that asset. And that's generally um, within the, the sale and purchase agreement. And once that period of time has elapsed, then the opportunity is lost. So one of the things we've worked on a lot with AWS is the ability to undertake uh, a data landscaping exercise, followed up very, very quickly with a migration acceleration process so that you can see the overall data landscape. And one of the things that we're able to do is to look into all of the different geoscience applications. It continues to interest me that we see the same geoscience applications by name in different companies, but very often they have a very different workflow. So although you're dealing with the same series of applications, they're deployed in different ways for doing different things. And um, overall, you know, to give people a feel maybe of the of the opportunity, um, we worked with AWS on a, a, a purchase of a very large asset. Uh, it had um, a, a large number of fields or a significant number of fields, a significant amount of production. And over a 10 week period with three different phases, uh, we were able to undertake that landscaping, that data uh, migration acceleration uh, and provide to the new owner uh, a unique insight to the totality of the data sets and which data sets they really needed and which application data sets they needed to take on that new asset. So that gives you some sort of feel for how quickly you can start to deploy the technology and move into a cloud, cloud native working environment. So hopefully that gives people a, a feel for the sorts of things that can be achieved. Thank you so much for that insight. We actually have a question here from um, at this point from one of our attendees who wants to know for cloud optimization, how can 3D grid static dynamic reservoir models be used to 
to help users improve their workflows. Mick, would you like to take this or direct this question to one of the panelists? I, can, you, can you repeat the question? I missed part of it. Can you try again? Sure. Sure. Well, well, they want to know if in the cloud optimization, how can 3D grid, static, or dynamic reservoir models be used to help users improve their workflows? So that's, I mean, it's very specific to application. I mean, the cloud itself doesn't really handle uh, 3D grids. Uh, it's just really re related to software applications. So typically, uh, if there are some limitation in handling that kind of data in some application, often is connected to the ability to access uh, the proper hardware capabilities, often GPUs from NVIDIA of a certain uh, size or a certain amount of memory if the, if the grid is, uh, is bigger than, uh, than a certain amount. In that case, the cloud, the, the contribution of the cloud in that situation is that you can choose pretty much ad hoc uh, instances that are appropriate to the requirements uh, of the specific task instead of being limited by whatever the company has given you on your on your specific workstation. So that's that's in terms of visualization. Uh, obviously, this also spills into the simulation part of grids. That is also another part where often uh, inside all companies, uh, individual uh, uh, reservoir engineers, uh, either they do simulation on their own workstation, and there are, of course, limitation in performance on that, or they have to wait in a queue with other people waiting for when uh, high performance computing clusters are available for that. That problem goes away in a cloud environment because of course there's unlimited capacity you can always tap into to run your simulation uh, at will. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Our next question is actually from a geologist with uh, some oil and gas background and they'd like to know if one of you could please explain how a geologist with data science background can contribute in the overall cloud system through examples if possible. Simon, do you want to take that? Thanks, Mick. That uh, sounds a bit like some of my background as a, as a, a past <laughs> geologist in my life. So um, I, I, I guess overall that what we see um, specifically is that actually um, a lot of companies are moving towards self-service data management. So they're, they're moving out of the, the, the world where the data management activity is in some way divorced from the overall operation, um, but they want to move to it becoming part of the geoscientist, the geologist's overall um, workflow. And, and I guess, you know, the, the things that, that are enabling a lot of that is the ability to have APIs, to script things, and to have Python. And, and that probably leads uh, essentially back into Andy's world and Fabrice's world. But, but certainly um, the, the, the move into those sorts of knowledge base and technologies I think are going to be important for any geoscientist in the future. Excellent. I don't know Thank if anyone you. else wants to comment at all. Yeah, sure. maybe a, maybe a quick comment from the maybe user experience is I think the because the cloud of bringing everything into one single place, you know, is removing the the traditional seventy percent of the time dedicated to finding the data and and moving the data and provisioning servers you can change the user experience in fo focusing really on working and analyzing. And I think the what we've seen is uh, a huge need um, for uh, collaboration. How do I expose to these data sets and this analysis? So in our case, it's through dashboarding and, and, and the ability to collaborate and have to bring different teams that geographically are um, you know, decentralized or maybe uh, bridge, you know, uh, right now you would see from one department sometimes to another, you know, a lot of compartmentalized way to analyze and not that having those common points or common space uh, where they can see, have the same view and talk about the same thing. It sounds very trivial, but I think that's what we see is going to change in terms of user experience. And, and, and to the previous question around maybe reservoir and it touch about all the, the, the performances, I think the cloud has come a long way where our, we're, we're, we're trying to improve all the time, you know, the user experience. And there's a lot of strategy around, you know, compression, decompression, decimation, and other things where you can do to create really good experience and, and visualizing, navigating through all that data, 2D or 3D. So that would be just my, my comment to additional comment to what Simon was talking about. 
good insight, Fabrice. Thank you. Um, our next question is about uh, cost savings, really. If you could please tell us, how can enterprises find the best cost model? That's a pretty broad question. So, um, I, we so let's let I tell you how we ap approach this. So typically with customers, we we do an in-depth analysis working with them. Uh, if they either work in a collaborative way with with AWS, we can we have people that can go in and completely analyze not only the hardware, the infrastructure, their working storage, and so on. And uh, and and usually we can come up with a pretty compelling uh, model, you know, economical model that of course also help them move from a capital to to a uh, you know operating um, model. That's another important thing that the cloud brings. So they don't have to buy up front and invest for over three years with a typical three year cycle where you're stuck with a certain hardware for three years uh, and then you can get some new you know new technology. You can have continuously the latest and greatest technology at, at your fingertips uh, and that's a significant advantage, especially for high performance computing and for very heavy uh, applications like such the one that we have in, in oil and gas. In, uh, they all tend to take advantage of NVIDIA GPUs, Intel CPUs, and large memories uh, as much as you can give them uh, typically. So in the cloud, you have that, op that opportunity. All right, thank you. Make anybody else like to add to that? Yeah, I think it's, it's difficult to really truly analyze, but the, there's, there's the pure costs and the IT costs that are sometimes a little bit more tangible, but you, you've got to also look at oil and gas companies are dealing, they're doing more work with less people and they're having to make some really significant decisions that have big consequences if they get them wrong. There's a lot of cost involved in some of those things. And if you can get more certainty into those decisions by using things like deep learning or interpret quicker and, and th those things add huge amounts of value to offset some of the perceived costs. And I think most, most oil and gas companies don't really have a good handle on what their current IT costs today. So it's kind of hard to compare um, in, in many ways. So it's difficult. I would also add that COVID has added another dimension. Sorry, I'll, I'll give it to you, Simon, in a second. So COVID okay. also opened up an interesting perspective. Some companies that were relying on traditional IT centralized and security really struggle to handle uh, you know, hundreds of people working from home trying to keep working on their you know, exploration, development, and production projects. So I think COVID opened up the eyes of everybody, not just in oil and gas, on what is the value of having a, a, a easier kind of cloud-based collaborative infrastructure? Simon. Yeah, sorry, uh, Mackay. You know, I, I think there are two aspects to the question in my head. And the, the first is that, I'm not going to say simple, but it is a relatively simple, what is the storage cost? What's the, what's the enterprise storage cost for the data? And, and you can go through by doing the data landscaping work and stuff we've uh, work with with AWS, you, you can get some very good handles on how far you can reduce that direct storage cost. Um, th there are then other questions about how do you take lots of data that maybe is sitting in tape in warehouses and never gets access, never gets used. Is that just a, a stranded asset and how do you bring that into the cloud? But I think the, the real value um, proposition is that reduction in cycle times, that increased certainty of decision making as I said before if you can define the reserves better if you can do those simulations using elastic cloud compute so that you're doing more and more simulations more quickly to increase the certainty of decision making then that's probably the greatest value increment that you're going to achieve as a geoscientist working in a in an energy company so I, I think there are two aspects the direct cost saving but more importantly is the value creation and the reduction of cycle times. Um, maybe those are harder to uh, actually quantify, but very significant. Sorry, Fabrice. No, no, I, I, I love what you say because I'm gonna echo that a, a little bit differently, but just doing digital transformation, I think the answer is, is individual to each company because the size of the companies we're dealing with, it would be hard to say, okay, you're gonna save 30% here um, randomly, so I think each company needs to do their homework. I think there's a cost of not doing it 
which is measurable because it becomes unmanageable. Um, COVID has shown it quickly, but you know, even before COVID, we saw some questions from operators which were not sure what they had bought, you know, what they had acquired. Um, they had issues also of people retiring and also the knowledge leaving the place and have to 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 fill that gap. So I think the real questions to the cost is obviously individual and you have to build your, 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 your cost justification to embark on that. But it's not just, uh, if you look at it just from the cost perspective and not the value as men, Simon mentioned, I think you miss probably the point. It's kind of a, a transition which had a lot of value over time and, and, and make things manageable and, and we're still running the operation. So um, not dodging the question, but I think it's individual to each customers and each uh, operators. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Well, moving forward with the questions, our next question from our audience says, how can centralizing data in the cloud make it easier for an operator to integrate technologies from multiple service companies? Oh, yeah. So I think that's a, a pretty significant value because that's, uh, first of all, one thing that it's uh, that we see quite often is there is a lot of companies with very innovative products. I mean, the, the one on the call with me today are, are three perfect examples. And sometimes for, for a business or an asset team to evaluate a new technology, they have a lot of internal barriers to be able to test some new software and so on. So that's something that the cloud makes uh, very easy to do, for example. So that we have a marketplace for energy specifically for companies. So a customer that has a relationship with AWS can simply go to the marketplace, uh, download possibly a demo license or a test license in agreement with the company, and they can immediately test it. Um, so that, that's another example. Same thing for training. If you want to train people, often maybe the system that are available inside the IT are not uh, up to the specs required, maybe for machine learning or HPC or some heavy interpretation, you, you'll be able to pick whatever um, tool you want. And our effort from AWS, just in the example on this call, we're trying to bring the ecosystem together. Everybody has strength, and they, if you bring multiple parties together, the customer benefits because now you get a best of breed approach. Instead of everybody trying to do everything, it may be doing two things great and the other things just because you have to. I see a future where everybody will really focus on what they can do, sit on an SDU foundation, for example, and, and the customer will be able to pick and choose best of breed. I think that's a real powerful model. I, I think I think there's a there's an additional aspect to that. Is if I'm pretty sure that every oil and gas company has a big box of data that they have from when they acquired <laughs> a company or a set of assets from another company. And if all of that data over time made its way into something like the OSDU data platform collaborating with a partner around the field is going to be a lot easier because they can simply just connect people to that same data platform as opposed to migrate data back and forth and move data around so there's there's opportunities that haven't even presented themselves yet that will become more and more apparent um, with these open data standards and being able to deliver data through APIs to data scientists, to geologists, to interpretation applications. So. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you there, Andy. And, and what we see is that reliance on tribal knowledge uh, is something that is going away fast. And when you move assets, you don't necessarily move the people. And you need that ability to understand what you've got and disconnect the data from the applications and, and that allows new ways of working you can use the apis you can do very quick pocs to see if you can deliver further value uh, and i think that is just such an advantage that osdu offers and working in the cloud offers and, and it will just become the norm of the future if i use an example very fast one of the osdu projects we have is exactly to use it as a share sharing secure platform in a joint venture in a specific asset. So that's something that sounds should be relatively easy, even in traditional, actually is not because connecting the security of different oil company is definitely not an easy thing. It's a lot easier to have a common environment that everybody trusts with the right security where you share only the data and application and other information that are appropriate for that specific asset, uh, asset team. 
Aris. Yeah, I had just a quick comment is that I think I think all the players are well aware, including the services company. That's that's the the model going forward. Um, just not to repeat exactly the same thing, but the example I gave is an expression of that, where Ali Burton, for instance, uh, for the integration we created between EDM and IVAP was uh, exactly addressing that point, which is now the, the services systems um, are becoming also uh, consumable through SDU and, and uh, open, you know, this interoperability or interconnectivity between the systems that needs to talk. So um, I, I think this is the new way of working, which is taking uh, gradually, um, you know, shape. And as Andy mentioned, you know, I think you don't need to to wait for 20 years to start it when everything is in place. It's starting now. So you need to start incrementally, test, play with it, and gradually, you know, start to drive value into that. And and I think it's much more successful than the Big Bang approach. It's an iterative approach, incrementally uh, bringing value um, that, that we can, we've all worked together, I would say, to start now. Excellent. Thank you, Fabrice. Well, one thing's for sure, I think your discussion has sparked a lot of interest among our audience because we're getting some really good questions. Um, our next question from our attendee is, how do you manage ownership of seismic data in a cloud environment? Is there a copy of the data per owner for multi-client data or just one managed by an ownership system? Yeah, so well, I'll make a comment and then maybe Simon has some additional uh, comments on that. So, the sharing of data is not just for seismic. That is something we do on a daily basis everywhere in our lives. So the example of, maybe it's not as critical, of course, in the case of a movie, but in case of bank accounts and, and so on, a bank, most banks are in the cloud. Most of our money is in the cloud on a daily basis. We connect to, to cloud-based systems. So that, that model of uh, deciding what is shared and what's not, and, and what is allowed depending on user uh, information, it's something that it's pretty well tested in many other industries, nothing really unique. Now, there may be something specific about, uh, there are some uniqueness in the oil and gas. There are some countries where the data cannot be exported, for example, that make things, uh, of course, specifically uh, complex or unique, I would say. Uh, there could be subset of the data that sometimes are accessible to a user and not the full data set. So there may be more granularity, but, but from a technology standpoint, the cloud can accommodate all of that. Simon, do you have some additional comments on that yeah i guess i guess Mick, it's really all about permissions it, mm -hmm. it is about the right to see data and and i think inherent is in the question is the fact that there are companies out there whose livelihood depends on the ownership of the data and, and those are the non-exclusive seismic companies and mm -hmm. therefore you need to manage those permissions very carefully and in transactions corporate transactions you know one of the questions that comes back is Am I buying an asset or am I buying a company? Um, and it, the lineage of that data is important. The contractual basis of behind the, the data is important. Um, but it, it really is, there's nothing in it that is insurmountable. Um, it could be very expensive if you get it wrong. And I, I'm aware of a couple of examples where it was got wrong and data was passed from one company to another where the permissions were wrongly assigned like that. But that is no more than a physical copy of the data. So really, the, the management of the data in the cloud is all about the permissions and the lineage and understanding the origins of the data. So I, I think there's nothing inherent in cloud working um, that makes that a, a, a particular issue in its own right. All right, Fabrice or Andy, do you have any comments? Yes. Um, I I talked to a client at one point and they were managing a library of seismic data that was um, expected to be shared with uh, with clients and, and they had a situation where they um, had to bring the data down, bring it into a system, a huge data set, um, create a subset of that data, put that data onto a disk and then ship it to the individual person. It, in, in a more modern environment, that is simply a case of streaming a subset and providing that endpoint to the user that can only get access to that subset of data. Um, and, and all of that can be handled through, through a central library. 
Um, you know, for instance, if you subscribe to H HBO, you get access to the HBO library or something else. And it's it's really procedural, but how you handle it in terms of coding and 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 the simplicity of it is much 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 different. Um, but it still does come back to permissions and and those things. Uh, managing permissions doesn't go away. It's just how you deal with the permissions is what changes. The, on, the only thing I like to add is that often this thinking about moving data is related to the fact that in traditional IT, you need to move data to get something done. So you need to move a file from the file server to the HPC group or to instead in the cloud environment when everything reads and writes through the same scalable storage architecture within an SDU foundation, you you tap into compute, you tap into machine learning, you tap into visualization. It's not something you need to move. So and then with the streaming, that is extremely powerful as well. Great, thank you, Megan. Now we're running out of time, so three minutes left. We'll just take one last question. Um, so, will accurate metadata help create a referenceable data set for a particular asset that can be quickly found and used in an application? Simon, do you want to take that? Seems to be. Oh. So it seems to be right up my street, doesn't it? <laughs> I think I think accurate metadata is my lifeblood. Um, so so my answer to that would be absolutely. And and if you can have that accurate metadata, if you associate it with the asset, if you associate it with the applications, then you've got the foundations to build upon. And really, I look at it as like the foundations to a building that you can create that accurate metadata. And we. Um, have a, a sort of internal saying, which is about uh, discovering what you've got, discovering all of the metadata, creating the rich metadata, then being able to analyze that rich metadata, and then being able to act upon it. And so for me, that's a fundamental part of doing good data management. It becomes more complex as time goes by, because we have more and more applications, we have more and more uh, data, you know, seismic data becomes more and more complex. We used to shoot 2D, we go to 3D, we go to MAS, we go to WAS. The, the complexity of the data itself may continue to increase, but the metadata is the thing that describes it and, and is absolutely fundamental to moving into OSDU, working in the cloud, and managing your data sets effectively. So you can see I feel fairly passionate about that. Yeah, I think an interesting consideration is that we only have metadata for, let's say, well-curated data types. At the same time, there are tons of other data connected to a project, to a field, that are not properly tagged. Think about PDF files or all kinds of other documents and images and scans. They have information that actually using machine learning, optical recognition, new technology, you can automatically extract and then bring it together into the same data foundation. Now you can correlate all kinds of data you didn't even know or was very difficult for you to find because they were not digitized and properly uh, tracked. So there is, that's what opens, that's what the cloud opens in terms of opportunity with a common platform. Thank you, Mick. Any final closing thoughts or comments from you, Fabrice? Um, no, very excited to be here. I think it's um, it's um, we're just the beginning of it. So I think the the next five years, ten years, going to be even more exciting. So looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I think you all gave us some excellent in-depth insights on the subject. Well, I really enjoyed our discussion today, and I hope you all did too. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.